Hello, welcome to chapter nine. So if you've made it this far in the statistics course, congratulations, because we are almost done. This is the penultimate or second to last chapter. And I would say it's ultimate in terms of its importance. Uh, so almost everything that we do and that we read about in statistics uh, has to do with either confidence intervals or hypotheses test. So taking a small sample of data and trying to decide what the overall population is going to look like. And that has enormous applications in business and engineering, in uh, medicines, and trying to decide if a medicine is going to be safe or not, or how effective that medicine is going to be. So this is, this is the crux, the heart and soul of statistics. And we will use every single chapter in this chapter, uh, pieces and parts of every single chapter. The idea of randomness from chapter one, that's in here. The idea of a mean and standard deviation, of course, z-scores, all that is in here. The, uh, that's from chapter two. And then the ideas of probabilities and probabilities uh, for binomial distributions. That's going to be in here from chapters three and four. Uh, and then hugely important is going to be the ideas that were in chapters six and seven of normal distributions and how we can compute stuff for normal distributions and sampling distributions and how we can compute uh, areas of the sampling distribution curve or z-scores and t-scores for sampling distributions, uh, the central limit theorem, and then the stuff that we actually did do in chapter eight will be really good preparation for the things that we will do in chapter nine. And then this course, as you know, is uh, organized so that most of the work that you do on this chapter will be in the chapter nine homework in Newton. And the chapter nine homework in Newton is really good but it doesn't give you a single picture of how all of the elements, all of the different questions in Newton tie together. And so that's what we're going to try to do with this video. And uh, we're going to really try to drive home how all of the different elements relate together. And I'm gonna call them steps. So. Uh, to do a full hypothesis test, you really need all of the steps that I'm about to label as steps, and I'm going to give you five of them. And if you have done a hypothesis test and you've skipped or missed one of these steps, then you probably aren't going to have a lot of confidence in the results of your hypothesis test. So let's just go through this and we will uh, kind of do this with an example as we go along. So our first step, and we really can't proceed if we miss this step. Uh, all of our conclusions are invalid if we miss this step. In your projects, you probably will miss this step actually. Um, it kind of depends, but most likely you will miss this step. But you'll proceed for academic purposes. In real life, if you've missed this step, you might as well not proceed. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of a lot of the statistics that you'll see have missed this step. And so when you look at the conclusions of statistics, just like uh, the um, famous author Mark Twain said, there lies damned lies and statistics. This is probably what he was talking about. Um, if you don't meet your assumptions for a test, then your conclusions are lies. They, they aren't actually true. Uh, so I kind of consider this very um, important and probably the most underestimated and disregarded step of all of the hypotheses test. Uh, so we have kind of three assumptions here. I have one that's iffy. So uh, it depends on what type of means tests that we do. Means tests, by the way, should always be done for quantitative data. Uh, you cannot compute uh, 
uh, a means test if you have categorical data, for instance. And so we know we have quantitative data, and so that means we either want to do, just like the last chapter with the Z interval or the T interval, we either want to do the Z test or the T test. And in order to be allowed to do Z, we have to know the population standard deviation sigma. So uh, that's how this is similar to chapter eight. Um, and then for both the Z test and the T test, we need two things to be true. We need first to have collected a simple random sample. Uh, and if you'll recall all the way back to chapter one, because it's been a while, to get a simple random sample, the textbook says there are two ways to do that. You can either take your entire population and write out the subjects of your entire population, um, their names or however you identify them, and put them on little slips of paper and put them in a hat. Now, if you're dealing with thousands or tens of thousands or millions or whatever, uh, that's an impractical way to do it. So the second way is to number all of the people or all of the subjects in your entire population from one to however many there are, and then to use a random number generator, uh, like your calculator, to choose. And so really, if there's not a hat involved in shaking up the names in a hat or a random number generator, you did not do a simple random sample. So uh, the first and most important part of this is the simple random sample. And then number two, your population needs to be approximately normal. And this one is missed probably more on the projects than anything else because people won't actually look at the population. Uh, so you actually have to look we don't usually have the entire population, but we'll look at the data that we do have. So look at the histogram of your data and see if it is normal or not. Um, and then as a backup, if your data is not this perfect normal bell-shaped curve, it turns out the stuff that we learned in chapter seven tells us, hey, we're probably okay to go. So, um, but always look at your data first that's your first line is to look at the data. And then if you have something that's not terribly far from normal, not too skewed, not too many outliers, and you have at least 30 data values, like chapter seven says, then it turns out we can waive the second assumption and still be okay to accept our conclusions. So uh, those are the assumptions that we need to have. Uh, and let's look at a particular example for that. And I'm going to try to carry this example through all of the different steps. So this is from the textbook. It says, it is believed that the mean height of high school students who play basketball in the school team is 73 inches. That's 6'1". Six, six so that's pretty tall, but basketball players are pretty tall. And then we have a standard deviation of 1.8 inches. A random sample of 40 players is chosen. The sample mean was 71 inches. And the sample standard deviation is 1.5. It says years. I'm thinking they mean inches. Do the data support the claim that the mean height is less than 73 inches? So did we meet our assumptions in this scenario? Well, we did meet one assumption. Uh, it says a random sample is taken. We're going to go ahead and assume that's a, a simple random sample, but that's not a big stretch. To say randomness, that means that they either used a random number generator or they used a hat because anything other than a random number generator or a hat means that we chose the sample or that we let the sample choose themselves. So choice was a factor if we didn't use a random number generator or a hat. Uh, so we did meet that assumption. And then the second assumption is, uh, is our data normally distributed? Well, this problem actually doesn't contain enough information to tell us that. If this had been a project or if they had given us the actual heights of the 40 players that was in our sample, then we could look at a histogram of those heights. And in that histogram, we would ask ourselves, is this 
normal or close to normal. Even without that information, though, um, we probably could proceed because we know that we have 40 players. And we know from the central limit theorem that unless we've got extreme outliers or extreme skewness, uh, then we can be sure that 40 players being more than 30, 40, um, a sample size of 40, uh, would be enough for our sampling distribution to be normally distributed. And that's the one that we really care about. It talks about our population distribution, but it's really the sampling distribution that we need to be normally distributed for all of the test statistic and p-value steps to work correctly. Uh, so we'll go ahead and give this one a pass. Um, know that if we did have extraordinary circumstances where we had a lot of huge outliers or extreme skewness that we would have been wrong, though, to proceed here. But we'll go ahead and proceed and assume that when we look at those 40 players, they won't be terribly far from normally distributed. Um, but do remember when you're doing these things to look at your data first uh, for that extremeness. And if, extreme, and if the data is extreme, then um, you, can't, you can't do the test. And then there are two other things that we want to consider as well when we are thinking about do we go ahead with our assumptions on this normality. So what if you're not normal? You want to look and see at the sample size, of course, we've talked about that. So the larger the sample, the further from normal you can be and still have your sampling distribution be normal. Also, uh, we want to consider do we have a two-sided test? So a two-sided test works in our favor too, and that's when the alternative hypothesis symbol is not equal to. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, so if we have not equals to, which is a two-sided test, uh, then it turns out that we're usually good to go, especially if we have more than 30 data values, even if we've got really skewed, really extreme data. But we kind of measure all three of these together. How much more than 30 data values do we have? How extremely skewed is our data? Um, and do we have a two-sided test or not? Uh, so in some instances, in a lot of instances, a one-sided test is enough if you have a large data set or you have normally distributed data. Um, but if you have all three, the trifecta, if you have just a one-sided test, if you have a small data set, and if you have very skewed data, that's when you definitely do not proceed. So you say, no, nope, we've got three strikes against us. We've just got the one-sided test, the small sample size, and the very skewed data. Um, we're not going to do this test. Uh, so to talk more about the two-sided test, um, that's our alternative hypothesis symbol of not equal to um, is the two-sided. And this brings us to step two. So we've covered the assumptions part, um, and now we're on the hypothesis um, step. Sorry. Uh, and you can see that these are the other three steps in our five steps for hypothesis tests for means. And the other hypothesis tests for proportions will have these same steps but the details of those steps will look different. They'll have different assumptions, uh, and instead of mu, they'll have p. We have mu for a means test because mu represents the population mean mu, and anytime we're doing hypotheses for means, we're hypothesizing about what the population mean is. Uh, there's no reason to hypothesize about what the population, um, the sample mean is because we already have the data and we can just take the data and average it and that is our sample mean. So no reason to hypothesize about what the sample mean uh, is. We are trying to make guesses about what the entire population mean is based on our sample. And so with that, our alternative is that guess. So we make a guess and our alternative is that guess. Uh, 
when we have just 30 or 40 data values, or even if we have 5,000 data values, which is an absolutely enormous sample size. Um, if we have 5,000 data values and we're trying to estimate something for the entire population of all Americans, 330 million Americans, uh, you can imagine that even just one data value that's different from our 5,000 will change the average um, age, for instance. Uh, so if we do average age and we add in one more person who is 85, uh, then and our average age happens to be um, 42.8, 78843, um, something like that. So if we add in just one more person, that's going to change our average. And so we never, ever, ever say um, in our alternative hypothesis, which is the one we want to prove, it's kind of our original hypothesis. What, what did you originally intend with this hypothesis test? So we can never say exactly equals. We can say it doesn't equal, we're, we're sure it doesn't equal this, or we're sure it's less than this, or we're sure it's more than this. And when I say sure, I'm just saying that you have a really good hunch. Um, so a hypothesis, a hypothesis is just an educated guess. So based on your experience, based on what you've seen, um, you're going to make a, a good guess that um, one of these things is true. So uh, for instance, you might say um, that most people pass the final exam. So the mean of the final exam would be greater than 60, for instance. Um, and you might also say um, that uh, the average of the final exam is not an A, so the average is less than 90. Uh, and then uh, you might say that the average of the final exam is not exactly 75, and so uh, you would say the mean does not equal 75. So you could say any of these. It is the researcher's prerogative to choose the alternative symbol um, and to choose the alternative values and you will actually be doing that for your projects you will choose what um, which of the variables you want to uh, create the hypotheses test for and the confidence intervals for and you're going to choose uh, the actual hypotheses so that will be completely your choice. You should not actually look at the data before you choose these hypotheses. So go with your gut instincts of, I'm pretty sure this is true, or I'm pretty sure this is true, without actually looking at the data. Uh, and then your null hypothesis, um, in general, what I like to do is just remove the symbol and replace it with an equal sign, and that's your null. Um, so your null hypothesis should be um, kind of the default hypothesis. If your alternative um, <clears throat> is uh, not true, then the null um, is there as kind of an opposite. Um, but it, instead of an exact opposite, I prefer to just use the equal sign. Uh, so that's nice and easy. The null is always equals. Sometimes the textbook, though, will allow for you to use the very opposite. So, for instance, um, if your symbol is strictly greater than, then the opposite one would be less than or equal to. So, if you choose greater than, and then your null of less than or equal to would go with that if you wanted to. Likewise, if you choose a, an alternative of less than, strictly less than, then your null could be greater than or equal to. Notice how the null always has the equals symbol as part of it, um, no matter which of these symbols that you choose. And the alternative never has equals as part of it. So uh, that's important to keep in mind when you're talking about your hypotheses. And then if we think about our scenario, um, so we've got the mean height of high school students who play basketball is 73 inches with a standard deviation of 1.8. We've got our random sample of 40. The sample mean was 71 
and the sample standard deviation was 1.5. Um, usually the very last sentence, the question sentence, contains the alternative hypothesis. And that's true here too. Do the data support the claim that the mean height is less than 73 inches? So here we can tell that the researcher wants to prove that the mean height is less than 73 inches. The original claim was that it was 73 inches, but our researcher wants to prove um, that it's actually less than 73 inches. So here we would choose this one, mu less than, and our mu zero, uh, the mu zero represents a specific number, a specific data value. So here mu less than 73 would be our actual alternative hypothesis mu less than 73 and we would put HA in front of it to say hey this is our alternative hypothesis HA um, mu is required the less than is required and then the 73 value would be required and expected so essentially there should be um, several different elements of each hypothesis you should tell me whether it's HO or HA you should tell me what parameter mu here always for the means P for the proportions when we get to that um, you should tell me the symbol less than greater than or not equal to for alternative hypotheses and then you should tell me the value so HA mu less than 73 would be what we'd expect for this and then for the null hypothesis, I would just lift out that less than and make it equal to. So um, HO mu equals 73 would be my null hypothesis for this scenario. And then for this next test statistic, we will either have a z-score if we're doing uh, a means test that has the population standard deviation sigma or we will do a t-test if we don't know sigma and we're using s to estimate sigma. Um, the t-scores tend to be larger than the z-scores and we have a little extra unknown when we use s to estimate sigma and so that's why we use the t-scores. And t is gets bigger and bigger and bigger um, if we have a small sample size um, because it turns out that this is further is probably less accurate as um, the sample size is smaller uh, so t scores depend on degrees of freedom which is n minus one so it's, it changes depending on the sample size but we'll either use the z score or the t score uh, and basically what we have uh, we have remember the sampling distribution in chapter 7. Um, so the sampling distribution is the distribution of all possible x-bars. So you could have an x-bar here, or you could have an x-bar here, or you could have an x-bar here, or here. You could have it anywhere. Um, most of them are going to be around this peak because this is like a frequency distribution. So most of your x-bars are going to be around um, the top of the bell. In other words, but occasionally you will have um, a f an outlier out at the, the bottom curve of the bell or somewhere in between. And so really what the z-score is, is standardizing this x-bar. Um, so it's the observed x-bar minus the mean of all x-bars divided by the standard deviation or standard error of x bars and remember in chapter 7 when we computed the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample means it was sigma <clears throat> and by the way sigma x and mu x is just sigma and is just mu that's just the textbooks way of saying it uh, so and then Newton's way of saying it is kind of mu zero uh, but so we have the mean and the standard deviation of the population but standard deviation divided by the square root of n is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution which is the one we're using because our observed data values are x bars. Um, so you either compute the t-score or the z-score depending on 
whether you know Sigma or you don't know Sigma. Uh, and then that's your test statistic. So um, we will then use the test statistic to compute the p-value. Uh, and actually, I want to do these together. Um, I think that, yeah, it'll pop up that uh, we want to do our scenario. But let's do the t-score and the p-value together because that's really usually the way I do them anyway. Um, so here, let's talk about the p-value and then we will actually compute our p-value for our scenario. So the p-value summarizes the evidence that's against the null. Um, basically what we do with the p-value is we say let's assume that the null is true. If the null is true um, that means that this will um, this is where the null goes essentially. It's saying that um, our value is zero because we put the actual hypothesized mean here in the center and we're saying hey the mean is actually true the null is actually true so if we um, get a t-score or a z-score that is zero or close to zero uh, then that's really kind of leaning toward the null or supporting the null it's not strong evidence against the null but if we have t scores that are way far out um, or z scores that are way far out way far away from the mean uh, then that makes it less likely to happen so what we do is we take our t score and then we compute the area of the tail uh, and we'll talk about more that more in just a second um, but we want to compute this area of the tail and that area of the tail is our p-value. Uh, and which way we shade for the tail depends on our alternative hypothesis symbol. Uh, but we'll talk about that all in just uh, a little bit. Um, now, you might notice that I have some strange things here. If we were computing these by hand, uh, which most of the time we don't want to compute them by hand. Uh, always, always, always try to use the calculator function that I'm about to show you, if at all possible. Uh, and then, if not possible, uh, we will try something else. And this is the something else. So, uh, remember back in Chapter 6, where we had all these pictures of the normal distribution, and the mean was always in the center, um, and if we wanted to use a z-score, the zero would have been the center of the z-score distributions. And then we could have marked our z-score. And we would have done inverse norm because in Chapter 6, everything was a normal distribution. Um, so we would have done inverse norm, area to the left, and the mean and the standard deviation. Uh, and then if we wanted to find the area under the curve, the area would have been normal CDF, not TCDF, but normal CDF, min, max, and then the mean and the standard deviation. But if you happen to have a T score um, instead of, or a T distribution instead of a Z distribution, remember the T distribution is not a normal distribution. It is close to the Z distribution, or the standard normal distribution, but it's not actually the same. And it changes depending on degrees of freedom. So most calculators, and my calculator does have, um, the TCDF where you can compute a T-score if you know the minimum of the shaded region, the maximum of the shaded region, and degrees of freedom, which is N minus one. Uh, so it's pretty easy to do the TCDF if you have that calculator function. And it's pretty easy to do inverse T if you have that calculator function. So you might be given some problems where you're told the T-score and you're told which way to shade or given enough information to know which way to shade and you're asked to find the P-value, which is the area of the tail. And so the, the P-value, you could use TCDF to find that. Or conversely, 
you might be given the p-value and asked to determine the t-score and so that's you would draw a picture and use the inverse t function there uh, so I wanted to make you aware of that um, and probably you'll be doing this with z-scores more than t-scores but I wanted to let you know that hey you don't have to use the tables that's the way Newton will show you always with the tables um, you could use this instead and then uh, we want to think about our particular scenario so we have uh, this particular scenario we want to find both the test statistic and the p-value and the best ways to do that if you look at your formula card you have the calculator function for means and that says to do stats um, hit the stat button and then go to test and then to do uh, either for the Z test or the T test. Uh, so either option depending on whether you're given the population standard deviation Sigma. Here we are only given the sample standard deviation so that means we want the T test statistic um, the T test function instead of the Z test because we don't know the population standard deviation. In real life that will be happening almost all of the time. In Newton, half of your problems will be uh, the z-score and half of them will be the t-score, the t-test. Okay, for this problem, we want to use the stat button, our favorite button. It's getting worn out. Uh, and then we want to test because this is a hypothesis test. Uh, and you're probably pretty familiar with these functions now that you've completed chapter 8. And then uh, we want the t-test because we only have the sample standard deviation and not the population standard deviation. We do not have the 40 data values and so we will scroll to stats and press enter. And then our mu zero, remember back when we did the assumptions, when we did the very first, um, no, sorry, the second step, the hypotheses, so the alternative hypothesis actually will tell us our first and last inputs always on the hypothesis test. So our very first input is always the mu zero that we used in our alternative hypothesis and our very last input is which of these symbols we used. So remember um, because we were being asked um, is it less than 73 then we used the uh, symbol of less than and we used the value of 73. Um, so going down here, 73, um, and then going to my very last entry and selecting less than, um, that's my, hypoth my alternative hypothesis telling me both the first input and the last input. And then the stuff in between is usually just given to us. It's really nice that they just tell us these things. So a random sample, the sample mean was 71. So X bar is 71. And the sample standard deviation was 1.5. And there were 40 players who were chosen. And we've already done the less than, and so now we just calculate. And wow, um, so one thing that you'll want to notice here uh, is that we've got a p-value of 1.26 e negative 10. And so you might say, oh, the p-value is um, 1.26. But that's not actually true, because remember what our p-value is. Our p-value is area under the curve. Um, an area, the area of the whole curve, has to be 1, um, so it can never be more than 1. That would not actually make sense. Uh, so what E negative 10 is saying is that we want to um, take this decimal and move it to the left 10 spaces. So what this value really is, is you would do 0 point and then you would do nine zeros, zero, 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 
zero, zero, zero, zero, zero, zero, and then one, two, six, four, six. So this is really a very, 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 very tiny number. Um, and we can know that also by the fact that our T score is negative um, 0.8 uh, four, three, blah, blah, blah. So um, the T score, remember it would be labeled down here. So um, it levels off about negative three and positive three. So negative eight is like way out here somewhere. Um, so it would be way far away. So you can see why it's a very tiny p-value because there's very little left all the way out here. Um, so again, this is like negative three and this is positive three and that's usually where the the bell kind of levels off at um, or almost levels off at at the negative three and positive three. So to have negative eight point something um, it's going to be a really tiny, tiny p-value. Uh, and that's in fact what we have here. Uh, so this answers our question of the uh, test statistic. So the test statistic third step and the p-value fourth step are our t-score and our p-value here. Uh, so the calculator gives us both steps three and four, which is really nice. Uh, and then we want to do a little more detail as well. Uh, so um, how we shade our tails depends on the alternative hypothesis symbol. So if our alternative hypothesis symbol says more than, we shade everything that's more than, which ends up being the right tail. And then if our alternative hypothesis symbol says less than, we shade everything that is less than. So in our example, the negative 8.43 we would shade to the left um, and there would have been just nothing left um, after going that far out over here. Just nothing left, um, so or almost nothing. Uh, we did have 1.2646, something like that, e to the negative tenth. Um, so just a tiny, tiny smidge left. Um, and then if we have two tails not equal to, we actually do two tails. So if our test statistic is negative, we basically take the absolute value of it and do the opposite uh, test statistic that's positive. So on ours, if this had been a two-tailed test and we'd gotten a t-score of negative 8.4, um, we would have done negative 8.4 and then we would have also done positive 8.4. So negative 8.4 and positive 8.4 of course, that would have been way out here and way out here. Um, but And then you would find the extreme tail. So um, go to the right of the positive and the left of the negative always on the two-tailed. And then uh, it turns out that you could just find the area of one of the tails and double it. But the calculator does all this work for you. It decides which way to shade, and then if you need to double, and all that stuff. So if you're using the calculator, you don't have to worry about this so much. But at the same time, we want to know where our calculator is getting this information from. And so that's why um, it's good to know what's happening on the calculator. Uh, so again, two tails significance test, just take one of the tails and double that area. And that happens anytime we have a not equal to. So not equal to could be more than or it could be less than and that's why we have the two tails on the not equal to part. And uh, then we want the conclusion statement. So the very last statement is our conclusion statement. Uh, and here in this scenario, uh, we want to ask ourselves, you know, hey, what do we conclude about the basketball players? Um, so really in the conclusion statement, you're going to want to answer this last question by rephrasing the question in terms of yes, we can, um, yes, the data do support the claim that the mean is less than 73 inches, 
or no, the data do not support the claim that the mean is less than 73 inches. So you may want to take a, a second and pause the video and think about what we just did with our T-score and our P-value and think, hmm, do you think that supports the claim or not? So what we want to do to answer this question um, is we want to compare our p-value to alpha. And alpha we will use as a default of 0 0.05 anytime we're not explicitly told alpha. And alpha is usually equal to 0 .00, um, 0 0.05 or it's very close. So you might have a 1% significance level in which case 0.10 um, or I'm sorry, 0 0.01 for 1%, 10% you could also have, which would be 0 0.10. Um, you might have a 0.5% significance level, which would be 0 0.005. Um, so there would be an extra zero in there if there was a 0.5. This is the 5% significance level right here. Um, and then we would compare P to alpha. But any of those that I mentioned, um, 0.1 or 0 0.01 or 0 0.05 or even 0 0.005, our p-value was crazy lower than that. Because remember, our p-value was 1 point something e to the negative 10th, which means that we had to do 0 point and then 9 zeros um, before we hit that 1. Uh, so our p-value is crazy small, um, and so that means that it's less than or equal to alpha. Uh, so the first thing we, before we, you know, give our conclusion statement is we've got to decide do we reject the null or not. Um, so here, yes, we do reject the null. Uh, so whenever we have less than or equal to alpha, we do reject the null, and then that says we can conclude the alternative is true. Um, so we have sufficient data to conclude on average that the uh, height of basketball players for our entire school or whatever our population was in that scenario is less than, because remember that was our symbol, um, so we would write out less than, um, and then 73 inches. So going back to uh, this scenario, uh, yes, we can conclude that the data support the claim that the height on average for every basketball player on the school team is less than 73 inches. So that's our conclusion and that's how we would do conclusions. Uh, you may want to kind of write this information down um, or keep it somewhere uh, to kind of let you know as a guide of how you can conclude things. So um, tiny p-values. Uh, remember that we're assuming the null is true um, and then the tiny p-value, that's the probability that we would have gotten data that we got if the null really was true. So if we have a tiny p-value, um, our alternative is probably true. If we have a large p-value, then our alternative probably is not true. So uh, do keep that in mind when you're going to write conclusions for the test. No, not yet. And then uh, we have basically already talked about this. Uh, so just anything that's between zero and whatever your alpha is, is going to be, hey, I'm going to reject the null and say the alternative is true. Uh, and then if you don't reject the null, we don't, we don't make any conclusions. Uh, so you can go back here and you can see that we have this kind of wishy-washy statement. So if you don't reject the null, we never say the, the null is true. We never, never, never say that the null is true because the null says that it's exactly equal to some particular value. And there's no way that we can know that the null is exactly equal to a particular value unless we have the entire population of everything in 
the population. So we just make this wishy-washy statement. Oh, we can't conclude. Now that doesn't mean that it's true. It doesn't mean that it's not true. It means we don't know. Um, so we do not have enough data to conclude on average that. And if this had happened for our scenario, it didn't. We definitely proved it was true. Um, but if this had happened for our basketball scenario, we would say we do not have sufficient data to conclude on average that the mean heights of basketball players for the entire school um, is less than 73 inches. When we do this, the burden of proof is on rejecting. So when we don't reject, it's not at all the same as saying, we never say we accept the null hypothesis. And a nice analogy for this is when you look at criminal trials, you either do guilty or not guilty. Not guilty does not mean innocent. Uh, the, uh, that's very different. There, it, and it really, the verdict of not guilty does not mean not guilty. Uh, it means there was not enough evidence to prove guilty. And so... Uh, the burden of proof in a criminal trial is probably quite similar to the burden of proof in a hypothesis test where you want to be 90 or 95 percent certain, especially in a murder trial, you'd want to be 90 or 95 percent certain of guilt before you pronounce guilt. Uh, so uh, if you are only 80% certain that someone murdered somebody, um, you don't want to certainly give the death penalty, but maybe not even life in prison because that's a very, very long time. Uh, and so <clears throat> with that, uh, you might be 80% sure that they did it, but you still would let them go. Uh, and here we might be 80% certain of our alternative hypothesis being true, but if we're not 90% certain or 95% certain, then we have to let it go. And so, of course, with that idea, we're going to have a lot of error. Um, and uh, the type 1 error is the um, more serious type of error, you're correct here and you're correct here. So let's assume that we have the entire population data um, and we did a sample and we did a test with it. Um, so if we know that the po if we know that our HO is actually true and we said don't reject the null, that would be the correct thing to do because we'd make that wishy-washy statement of we, um, you know, we don't know that the alternative is true and it turns out the alternative was not true because the null was true and so we made the correct decision there. Now if um, we had actually rejected the null and said the alternative was true that's a very serious offense because we'd say the alternative is true and it turns out that it's not true. So um, we've made a very definitive statement and we were wrong about that statement. Um, so that's, that's a big deal. Um, so the type one error is the most serious type of error where you've made the definitive, um, we can conclude statement, but it turns out, uh, that the null was actually true and the alternative was wrong. Now, uh, there's a second way to be correct and a second way to be wrong, and that's if your null was actually wrong and the alternative was true and you rejected the null. So if the null is wrong and you rejected the null, that's a correct way to go too. Um, let's say the null was wrong and you failed to reject the null. When we fail to reject the null, remember we're making that wishy-washy statement of we're not sure if the alternative is true or not. Um, it turns out it is true, so that you have made an error, but the type 2 error is the less serious type of error. 